Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society. My name is Mark Pennington. I'm the Director of the Centre and the Head of the Department of Political Economy at King's College London, where the Centre is based. We're very pleased to have with us here today for the podcast Professor Jeff Hodgson. Jeff is Professor of Management at the London campus of Loughborough University. He's also the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Institutional Economics Um, and one of the world's leading experts on institutional and evolutionary economics. There are so many books that uh, Jeff has written that I've actually uh, lost count of them. Uh, So, Jeff, it's very nice to have you with us uh, here today. Thank you, Mark. You've actually got two books out uh, in the last year. Uh, Is Socialism Feasible? And Is There a Future for Heterodox Economics? I wonder if we could start the conversation by you just talking us through, um, well, first of all, how do you manage to write two books in a year, but maybe the actual rationale for these two particular books? Of, of, well, it takes longer than a year. Um, I mean, one has notes and ideas and thoughts uh, which you develop through time. I happen to do two books simultaneously, but it yeah. does take uh, a, a much longer pe- a period of time to complete them. Anyway, shall I, shall I talk about what's in them, as you as you ask? Um, the book on socialism is prompted by the political events of the time. I start the book by actually saying that while several thinkers, leading thinkers, had pronounced socialism dead in the 1990s, um, it's had a remarkable revival, um, largely attributed to the economic crisis after the crash in 2008 and other reasons as well but they have led together to a radicalization of thinking most notably perhaps in the UK and the US with the rise of uh, Bernie Sanders and other people on the left of the Democratic Party in the US um, being Sanders himself being a presidential hopeful candidate mm. in the last round and also the current round And also in the UK with um, the transformation of the Labour Party after Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader in 2015. Uh, But those two are also, it's not confined to to those two countries, it's also present in continental Europe and elsewhere. So this this revival of adherence to socialism, whatever people mean by it, is is a, a remarkable consequence of the crisis over the last uh, 15 years or so. Yeah. But the book takes that as its cue. Um, a lot in the book is not original. I, I rely on other thinkers like Hayek and uh, Michael Planey, who I regard as different, although they have commonalities. Um, but there are some elements of originality, partly in the way the book's organised. I... I make a distinction between what I call big socialism and small socialism. Mm. Uh, Big socialism reflects the statist version of socialism, which first fully uh, emerged with Marx and Marxism, and has took took root and become more prominent than the other version. The other version, small socialism, relates to the original use of the term socialism in the context of the Owenite communities yep. Yep. in Britain and in, in the US. And these were relatively small scale, up to a thousand or a few hundred more people, but relatively small scale. And in fact, remarkably, the Owenites didn't have any vision of how these multiple communities would, would interact. Inter- interact or yep. link together. And in fact, they, they hated competition and markets, so one wonders how it would be done. Mm. And... and, and um, in fact, they were silent, largely silent on the issue. But nevertheless, there have been numerous experiments with small socialism, which are occupy the first part of the book. Um, these include the Israeli kibbutzim. I also discussed the Yugoslav experiment, which um, the more I looked at it, it I mean, the, everyone imagines that the Yugoslav experiment was a experiment in self-managed worker cooperatives. But the more I investigated this, I found that actually it wasn't. 
these these were not legally autonomous units. There was still a strong statist element in the Yugoslav system, despite the toleration of markets and market relations. So that's uh, another case. I, and I, I trace the failure in the, of the Yugoslav system in part to that incomplete devolution of power to legally independent units. Uh, I argue, the conclusion of the book is that small socialism is viable as long as you fully accept markets and legal autonomy. But I also dwell on the what I call the agrophobic tendencies in socialism, which are fairly ubiquitous as a kind of rejection of markets, a rejection of competition, a rejection of property rights. And this was true for Owen as it was true for other subsequent socialists. And that circle can't be squared. Mm -hmm. You cannot uh, limit markets and have true de devolved power. So that's basically the argument of the first section. The second section is about large-scale state-centered socialism. And uh, everyone knows that uh, if you put to a Marxist or an advocate of this position, well, look what happened in the Soviet Union, look what happened in, in China, they became dictatorships, the horrible things happened, purges and famines and so on. The virtually unanimous, if not unanimous, response is, well, it will, it will be different next time because these were distortions, mm -hmm. these, these were oddities, these were due to leaders or external circumstances. And I try to debunk that argument. Uh, it's not an original point, but I think it's important to be made and remade, that there are tendencies within large-scale socialism which lead inevitably or without conceivable resistance, conceivably adequate resistance, to a concentration of political power alongside mm -hmm. the concentration of economic power and an undermining of autonomy, pluralism, diversity and so on. And these tendencies are imminent in that project. So, um, unlike some critics, I think that large-scale socialism is feasible, but not democratic large-scale mm -hmm. socialism. So, um, some von Miesians or others might say mm -hmm. it's not feasible at all. I would put it slightly differently. Yes, it is feasible, but it's not. it cannot mm -hmm. be democratic for the reasons I've just briefly touched upon. So that basically is the argument in the first two-thirds of the book, and then the last third I make a case for uh, some social, what I call social democratic liberalism, mm -hmm. or some mm -hmm. version of liberalism which um, accepts a significant interventionist regulatory role for the state, as we found, for example, with Keynes, who was a liberal and a socialist, um, with someone who is prominent to the book, as Michael Pliny, hmm. in contrast to his brother, Carl. Um, and I use their arguments and the arguments of others like uh, Hobson and uh, Hobhouse and other um, uh, in more interventionist liberal, liberals to make that argument and say we have to look at the terrain of capitalism and compare capitalisms and learn what's best and try and develop the best features of capitalism and minimise its worst features. That's basically the argument in the book in a nutshell. That's great. That's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful summary. Maybe I could just follow up on maybe the last part there and link it to you know, the motivation for, for, for writing the book. So you're very clear to make a distinction between socialism and social democracy. So you do see yourself as a kind of social democrat, mm. but also one that's clearly been influenced by arguments from the liberal tradition. I wonder whether you could say something about why you think, following the crash, there's been a movement towards, you know, sort of going back to what you describe as big state socialism, as opposed to embracing some form of radical Keynesian view or some other kind of you know, interventionist or redistributed politics, but which isn't about nationalizing everything or controlling everything from the center. Why is it that um, the left in the in the countries that you've mentioned has veered towards considering, you know, models that it's not that long since they were abandoned? Why have they moved in that direction rather than in the direction that you seem to think is actually the one that I think there should be followed? That's an interesting question. I think there's many issues involved here. Um, one issue is the fact that social democracy itself is a loose term 
and contains a number of diverse strands. And it would include, at least in my view, sort of Tony Blair and yep. Brown and the previous uh, pre-2015 leadership of the Labour Party, uh, as it could include people like the Clintons yep. and, and uh, Carter and other, other US presidents who have strong social democratic tinges to their to the, think, the liberal think. Um, yep. But, but uh, Blair would say he was a, a socialist of a kind, mm-hmm. but I think more accurately the social democratic label fits him. So, so uh, but to some extent, in the eyes of many, rightly or wrongly, maybe a bit of both, that the, that, that tradition that element has been discredited. Mm. So there's this discourse about what people describe rather inaccurately and loosely as neoliberalism, mm. uh, accepting um, austerity policies. And so they allege that these, these elements within social democracy have betrayed or mm. compromised that tradition. Um, uh, the, so some truth in that, So, but certainly it's had, the truth is it's had an effect. That perception, that narrative, yeah. had an effect on the Labour Party and other mm-hmm. elements elsewhere in other countries. That's one reason. Uh, the, the other reason is, is I think there's been immense terminological confusion over the meaning of the basic terms here, social democracy uh, and socialism. Um, there are a lot of people, I know, personally in the Labour Party, that call themselves socialists, which in fact, in my terminology, would be social democrats. One thing I do in the book is, in chapter one, if I recollect correctly, is to look at the meaning of socialism. And I think historically I established two points, that the meaning is fairly consistently, right through time, with a few exceptions I'll come to in a minute, meant the abolition of private property and some, some form of common ownership, either on a big scale or a small scale. And I, use, I assemble a lot of evidence from Peter and also thinkers and surveys and people who say this. Mm. A lot of the people in the Labour Party don't take that view. They just have this kind of fudged view of what socialism is. And they don't say, I'm a socialist, but they don't think that way. Mm-hmm. I would include people like uh, Owen Smith, who challenged Corbyn in the leadership yeah. debate, and Andrew Adonis, who also yeah. is a critic of Corbyn, but yeah. uh, wants, is so strong, strongly weighted to Labour. They just call themselves socialists, mm. uh, but... but they don't believe in that stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, there were challenges to this, but you can see they're unsuccessful mm-hmm. in the history of the Labour Party and also elsewhere. Whereas, by contrast, the term social dem- dem- democracy, which originally meant something similar to socialism, changed its meaning radically. And the big m- one of the big moments in this was the Bad Gudersberg Congress of the German Social Democratic Party when it declared in 1959, that the default position of that party was markets and competition, the default position, mm. right? In other words, we intervene where it's yeah. deemed necessary. Yeah. If we can't see a reason to intervene, then we leave it to the market, mm. we leave it to them. With all the caveats, the importance yeah. of social justice, redistribution, yeah. all the other things that social democrats want to do. Um, so, uh, so, so, as a consequence of that, social democracy changes meaning. Um, I mean, that was underlined with the formation of the Social Democratic Party in the 80s, which eventually merged with the Liberal Democrats. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a convenient label which you can differentiate from socialism. The Labour Party is ironically left with a socialism term. It was actually installed in the Constitution for the first time by Tony Blair. You know, the irony of irony is... <laughs> Well, he put it in, he rewrote clause, I didn't know that. He rewrote Clause 4. The original yeah, version of Clause yeah. 4, 1980 version, didn't have socialism in it. Yeah. It had common ownership in it. Right. So hmm. Blair rewrote it hmm. to say we hmm. need markets and whatever. Hmm. I mean, he did a dynamic private sector. But put the word socialism in. Labour is a democratic socialist party, it hmm. says. Hmm. So this, this feeds hmm. the hard left. The hard left are truer to socialism hmm. than the moderate left. Hmm. The moderate left describes them, so they're fighting over something where the hard left's always going to win the argument hmm. because it's true to that tradition. So that's another reason why I think there's a complete mess. Um, and I thought it's very, very difficult for Labour to to escape from hmm. the legacy of this terminology and well, these traditions. If I can interject at this point, I mean, it's also, I think, I really enjoyed the section of the book. The earlier chapters were talking about the use of terminology, how... The use of this term neoliberal mm. um, has meant that you almost can't have a conversation in certain yeah. areas because 
things that is anything turns out to be neoliberal if it isn't mm. full-blooded socialism. And I think there's a wonderful uh, line in the book where you say that, you know, if you follow this kind of reasoning, um, that when Lenin introduced the new economic policy to save, um, you know, the Soviet people from starvation, <laughs> this would have been described as a neoliberal policy by some of the yeah. contemporary left. That's actually um, right, that's actually right, yeah. Uh, and furthermore, um, uh, there's an academic called David Harvey, who's, I think, yeah. originally a geographer, yeah. but oh, a, Mar yeah. a Marxist, and he's written a book called A Short History of Neoliberalism. And he says the first neoliberal was Deng Xiaoping, the, <laughs> the great post-Mao reformer. Yeah. And Deng Xiaoping, actually, when he was trying to introduce, uh, more than introduce, trying to turn the entire Chinese economy away from a central planning system to much more to a, mar a market-orientated economy with the private sector, he said, get me the, the tax on Lenin's new economic policy, which Lenin implemented in 1921, because I want to learn from that to implement my policy. But lo and behold, though, David Harvey describes Deng Xiaoping as the first neoliberal. First neoliberal. <laughs> well, so he's inaccurate. Lenin was the first yeah. neoliberal. There's another crazy book, uh, which actually says uh, Joseph Tito and the Hungarian reformists were the first neoliberals. So neoliberalism begins in socialism. Yeah. And the whole thing is absurd. It's just ridiculous. I, I, I mean, Why do you think that label has become so ubiquitously used? I, mean, well, is it, is it? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a tendency, even in academia, where we're yeah. trying to be a little bit more uh, precise about things, to use words hmm. to, to, to summarise or tag yeah. issues without yeah. going into detail. Yeah. Like, I can remember when I was at Cambridge, the, uh, the heterodox economists or left economists in Cambridge used to say, make an argument, well, that's right wing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no further discussion required. Yeah. Just just put the label on it. So putting a label neoliberal on something, yeah. oh, no further discussion required. It's bad. Yeah. And uh, similar things happen with financialization. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm concerned yeah. about over-marketization of society, over-commercialization yeah. of society, of Christmas and everything else. Yeah. And so I may be worried about some aspects of that. But simply to assume that financialization yeah. is a bad thing hmm. is a bad move. But most the heterodox economists studying financialization simply assume that without discussion. Yeah. Um, so there's all this going on. It's not to, not confined to the word neoliberalism, but that's yeah. the most notorious yeah. case. There was an article which, um, if I remember, by Boas and Gans Morse, uh, which, which surveyed the use of the term neoliberalism, we found more than half of the academic authors didn't even bother to define it. To define, yeah. I mean, if there's a case for using the term in yeah. a certain restricted certain context, not sure you're clear about its meaning, but um, uh, if you don't bother to define it, you're not signaling anything. Yeah. And it, it has been severely degraded by over years. Well, you, you mentioned uh, some heterodox thinkers using the, the term, um, you know, are dismissing certain things as being right wing just because of that. Mm. Um, perhaps we could connect on to the second book, which mm. is: um, Is there a future for heterodox economics? I wonder whether you could talk through briefly the the rationale for writing that book. Yeah, well, that, that 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 was brewing for a longer time. Yeah, because I. I, uh, I started studying economics in the late 60s and more formally in the 70s, the master's degree and so on. And I always saw myself as a critic, um, as things I didn't like hmm. about mainstream economics. But I was interested in making uh, mainstream economics and I tried to learn it the best I could. I mean, some of the reasons I've changed my mind on some issues. I see virtues which I didn't see before and I see defects. Yeah again, which I didn't see before. But I'm still a critic, and so after 50 or so years, I, I remain a critic. So I always revolve around heterodox communities, and a number of things struck me um, way back. One is that there wasn't agreement about what heterodox me meant or what the principal criticisms of what mainstream economics were. And secondly, there was a, a strong emphasis, it wasn't universal, but there was a strong emphasis on policy issues. In other words, mm. policy became the front end of that. Now, the, the anomaly here is the Austrians, the mm. Austrian school, yeah. who are, in my view, not mainstream in the sense no. they assume the neoclassical core assumptions. Uh, they, they have a richer view of how markets operate and so on. 
Um, yeah, the politically they tend to be of a different mm. view. So the heterodox left has always had a problem, an issue about whether Austrian economists mm. are. Are they actually heterodox? Are, are they yeah. part of their, yeah. their their group or not? Yeah. Um, and that, that that's not resolved. And it's for some they're in, for others they're out. But mm. that's, that's that's a problem. But with that caveat aside, the rest of heterodoxy has been generally politically leaning, left leaning, and again making assumptions about the viability of certain policies mm-hmm. and approaches without going into depth. There's just a whole core of assumptions that just take just parked on the table in a box mm-hmm. without being opened up. Um, so that struck, struck me as one thing. The other thing that struck me was that heterodoxy wasn't making progress. Um, it's probably increased dramatically in numbers. I mean, also, I think it's been an exciting ride to see new varieties of heterodoxy grow. I, I, I was there and involved in the rise of institutional approaches, particularly in the 80s and afterwards. Uh, also, similarly for evolutionary approaches, yeah. which post-1982 uh, with Nelson and Winter's book also became prominent. That, for me, has been an exciting ride. But despite this um, rich legacy from heterodox uh, scholars, progress is limited. If anything, by some measures, it's backwards. Although they're probably more in number, if you count the number of people who describe themselves as critics or heterodox, um, they're dispersed all over the place, and Mm. not so much in economics departments. Mm. And in any case, they have less influence over mainstream or more prestigious economics departments, particularly in the English-speaking world. The loss of heterodox control of the Cambridge Department mm. is one just one case amongst many. Mm. Um, so why has that happened? So that led me to um, I, I had a training in philosophy before, but I, I became more interested in the philosophy of science and the uh, social aspects of the philosophy of science, including what you might call the the sociology of science. Um, read Kitcher's book on 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 science, which came out in the nineties. But then I shortly afterwards discovered Michael Planny again, who emerges in the other book. So Michael Planny is a hero of both of these books in a way, for different reasons, because Michael Planny was a great contributor to our understanding of how science works. And what Planny emphasizes, among other things, is the importance of authority. Mm. Authority is important, one, to establish some consensus, because you do need some consensus, and secondly, to screen out low quality, yeah. cranky stuff, which yeah. clogs up the system. So we don't necessarily like authority, but it's necessary to make the system function. And Kitcher makes a similar point, not without referring to Pliny, saying there's kind of optimal diversity. That if you have too much diversity, then you get nowhere. But you need some consensus to establish a core agreement upon which you can cumulatively build. And these accounts for me, were very striking and applied immediately to heterodox economics. It's this failure to, to have sufficient consensus. So though I had been involved, and uh, without regret, in agitation for greater pluralism in mm. economics, and I still support that, I think the other side of the coin is we do need to create a consensus. Which leads me in the book to the end, to, to the final chapter, to consider a number of possible strategies to answer the question in the title for the book, yep. Is There a Future? And I, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's eight strategies, if I recollect, but, but in the first two, are actually, one is to engage with mainstream economics, and the other one is to separate from mainstream economics. In short, I think both will fail, so, which is a rather odd position. You do one thing, you do the opposite, you fail, also fail. Why? I mean, engagement with would improve heterodox dialogue and sharpen it critically but it would fragment it at the same time. Because on key questions, different heterodox scholars will have very different, different. answers. Mm-hmm. An Austrian would have a very different answer from a Srafian, mm-hmm. who in turn will have a different answer from an institutionalist or from a Marxist. They would fragment on these key key theoretical points at the core. So it would lead to fragmentation and lack of, lack of identity of heterodoxy. So that's not necessarily bad, but that's the consequence of doing that. Those that stress the importance of heterodoxy surviving as a community, I think, will be disappointed. The other strategy is to separate. And the, the best living example we have of this is the Department of Political Economy, uh, not here, but no. the University of Sydney, yeah. uh, which yeah. is set up for entirely different reasons yeah. and in different contexts. 
um, it was set up in separation, in opposition to mm. mainstream economics. Mm. Understand, you don't have a mainstream or well, an economics department of any kind no, here. No, 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 no. Um, so the, the reasons are entirely different. So I'm not against the political I mean, label on it, but consider that basis yeah. for separation. Um, um, members of that uh, political economy department will claim uh, that they're doing well, they're recruiting students, have interesting courses and so on, all of which no doubt is true, but I think they're very vulnerable. They're highly vulnerable to um, mm. a stroke of the pen from mm. some, some dean who wants to rationalize resources mm. in some way and put the two part departments back together. Furthermore, um, while they are pluralist internally, have different approaches, ideologically they seem remarkably mm. less so. Mm. They have, they had, last year they had four honorary professors, mm. three of them which were Marxists. Yeah. Uh, one of them, Eric Olin Wright, is uh, sadly mm. deceased a few months ago. But this is hardly evidence of ideological pluralism. So pluralism doesn't seem to go to ideology, and if you look at the writings of the founders of the, the, the split-off department, Frank Stilwell and others, the writings about mainstream economics are very ideologically driven, I think in a rather unnuanced way, which one of them criticised. So I think there's also severe dangers with that strategy too. Do you think we could perceive that a little bit more, this issue about how effectively methodological questions seem to get confused with policy positions or ideological views in heterodoxy, because this is something that's always frustrated me. I mean, I consider myself to be quite a heterodox person in the sense I'm very influenced by Austrian school ideas. Um, there are lots of debates um, I would feel I'd want to engage with, with people who are post-Keynesians or institutionalists or evolutionary thinkers, these sort of uh, people that I feel we should have a kind of club identity mm. around those themes. Um, but because we might divide on policy issues, that seems to to come apart. And I, I don't quite understand how people can't club together on that aspect of the identity, the methodology side. Mm. Because, I mean, ultimately in policy terms, um, you know, there isn't really that much difference between somebody like Joseph Stiglitz, who's a, a mainstream economist, and some of the policy conclusions he has, and some heterodox mm -hmm. thinkers. Mm -hmm. In the same way, there might not be that much difference between some of the policy conclusions I might have um, and some members in the past of the Chicago School or whatever. Um, so why, why can't people get past that and actually you know, have an open conversation within a tradition that actually shares some commonality. So to me, pe people who are heterodox inclined should be united against perhaps the methodology of mainstream economics. But put the policy questions aside, why, why can't people do that? Because I think for many people, uh, policy is the preeminent issue. Yeah. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing, because no. policy is, is, is a good thing. But if you, if you think in terms of policy and ideologies that are behind policy, you may pay less attention to theoretical underpinnings and, and nuances. Yeah. So the fact that people like Krugman or Stieglitz yeah. uh, put Keynesian style policies, whether they're true Keynesian or not, we can yeah. debate, but this Keynesian style policies, which are similar, as yeah. you say, to many who describe themselves as exactly. heterodox, is kind of missed. Yeah. It's also another thing which I go on about in the book, probably too much, <laughs> is the fact that, you know, the original general equilibri equilibrium theories yeah. after Valra were socialists. The socialists, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Oscar Langer, yeah. so the whole apparatus yeah. was used in the 30s and 40s to promote yeah. a market simulation within the yeah. planned economy. Yeah. And uh, th th this is completely ignored. And also in the book I point out this was never discussed in Cambridge. Mm. It's ignored by Joan Robinson. It's not mm. any Robinson and Eve or mm. book. This was also pointed out by my, my one of my great heroes, who was Mark Blau. Mm -hmm. He made yeah. all these points again and again and yeah. again. And he's someone I actually miss a lot. He died uh, about 10 years ago. But... Um, he was a great, great man, a great economist, and he said these things long ago and made himself unpopular. I remember people saying, well, Mark Blanc said those things, yeah. those, those critical but very astute things about Cambridge. Oh, he's just right wing. <laughs> right. <laughs> End <Yeah>. of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I got to know him better, actually. His, his politics were much more complicated than that and very interesting to boot. It's interesting. I mean, people, people are strange. I guess that's the, <laughs> the only conclusion that I can 
<laughs> come to from this. Um, but I'm absolutely in agreement. I mean, there is so much in neoclassical economics which certainly promotes, um, if not radical socialism, although, yeah, you could interpret some uh, general equilibrium theory in that way, but it certainly promotes interventionism of yeah. the sort yeah. that many heterodox thinkers would be very yeah. sympathetic to. It um, assumes away all the problems of tacit knowledge yeah. Yeah. and asserts a kind of omniscient rationality yeah. Yeah. Which, which actually is conducive to planning yeah. if it exists in the Absolutely. real world. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, maybe taking on this on a little bit further, so I wonder whether you could say, you said there that you you've given reasons why you think heterodox economics um, as a sort of broad set of theories, I guess, is not in as good a shape as you would like it to be. And that's one of the reasons that you've written this this book. I wonder whether you could say something more specifically about um, institutional economics, which at least on some readings is a kind of subfield within the broad heterodox camp. But arguably with things like new institutional economics, there are some overlaps with mainstream, mm. more mainstream theories as well. So could you, do you have any thoughts yeah. on the current state of institutional economics? Yeah, well, I, I came to the view uh, 15, 20 years ago that um, current heterodox strategy wasn't working. So I'd already got myself very much interested in, in institutional economics uh, through the 80s and 90s, and also to things like evolutionary economics. But I saw problems in evolutionary economics as, as an organizing label. So, I, 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 so my efforts became concentrated on the institutional side without neglecting mm. evolution issues as well. And I, I, I think this is a, a strong candidate for interdisciplinarity. There, there are well-established institutional approaches now in, in e economics. We have Nobel Prizes being awarded to Williamson, yeah. Ostrom, uh, Coe's, and, and others for, for work, a North, um, including North, for, for their work in institutional economics. Um, often with, with a framework which is not exactly mainstream, but has yeah. strong elements of the mainstream yeah. in it. And, and, and there were original institutionalists before them, so this is a very strong tradition. But I, I, I'm of the view that because institutionalism now is such a broader issue within the social sciences, and others are making contributions outside economics, in political science, sociology, mm. psychology, and elsewhere, that an interdisciplinary approach is, 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 is a good way of moving forward. Um, and I, that's one of the strategies I outlined in the, in the Heterox Economics book. And that's where I'm concentrating my current efforts to a large degree. I mean, it, it, may, it may fail. We don't know. It's a complex, changing world, and its future's unpredictable and all that, so we don't know. Mm. So this, this may, may end up in, in, in failure. But we have an important precedent because there are there are elements in the history of academia where, which where interdisciplinarity has been created, and the example I use is innovation studies, which didn't exist thirty or forty hmm. years ago. There was bits of science policy, bits of this, bits yeah. of that, history of science, and it all came together. Technology studies and one or two other yeah. became innovation studies. A lots of money thrown at it became established in universities, top professors, hmm. degree programs graduate studies and so on. Now, that it would that be uh, it's very ambitious to go that far, but even if you, a few steps in that direction were made, recognizing the interdisciplinary project of institutional mm. research, I think, think we could make enormous progress. I think we have to convince policymakers within universities and also people awarding grants in the private and public sector mm. that, that institutional or social technology is just as important as the physical technology. You right. have to get the social rules right. Yeah. It's no, you won't, in fact, you won't do the inventing unless you've got the, yeah. the social rules right. And when you have the inventions, applying them, getting them to work, getting people to mm. manage them and employees to work in the companies that produce mm. them and use them, is not possible without a system of rules, of legal and informal yeah. rules. And clear institutional incentives to people to act in ways which are consistent with that project. Mm. So um, we have to make the case that institutional innovation, in, institutional mm. studies, is just as important as technological innovation and technology yeah. studies. And if, even if we made modest moves in that direction, I think that would be tremendous. Well, I would have thought this... Um 
there should be a more overlap between some of the concerns of institutional economics. If you think about the role that soft institutions or beliefs play, or the way ideas are communicated, with a lot of the work that takes place in uh, cultural studies or communication studies, these kinds of areas, which often see themselves as being quite sort of antithetical to economic ways of thinking, mm. but they're actually dealing with questions about how ideas spread, yeah. how norms change or whatever, that you'd think would be absolutely the terrain where they should be interested in the kind of insights that you would get from these fields. So that's something that very much interests me. Why can't there be more of an overlap between um, these kind of communication-oriented aspects of the humanities and institutional economics? Yeah, I agree with you entirely. I mean, we will find other areas where, where there's big overlap, particularly management schools, yep. management departments, um, in politics, in history, yep. uh, there's institutional approaches in history. Um, it, it, there's a, it's a very rich potential for making these connections. Part of the problem, again, though, is people use words differently. Yes. Uh, concepts, yeah. even when the sim similar words are similar or the same, hmm. have different meanings. So what do you mean by norm? What do you mean yep. by convention? All these things. Yep. Um, and you have to try and negotiate through that. You're never going to get a perfect no. agreement of these things, but you have to at least you make get people, people aware. To see that there, there are some similarities, at least exactly. in the class of things that exactly, people are looking yeah. at. Yeah, and, and I'm not naive about multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity because it's impossible for everyone to be hmm. multi or interdisciplinarity. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few people that think and work that way and, and synthesize uh, hmm. big ideas from different domains. But a lot of a lot of science is the hard slog with detail. Mm. It's doing the empirical research, mm. probing or testing different mm. hypotheses, evaluating different approaches using yeah. evidence, and that's hard slog yeah. and the detailed technical stuff. And we need lots of people to do that, to do that. as well yeah. as the visionaries that are going to synthesize and yeah. bring, bring new theories together. And then they're in the relative minority. I mean, do you feel that um, the journal institutional Journal of Institutional Economics, which I think certainly is a great success from the way I enjoy reading it. Has that, does that reflect, the content of that reflect, you think, an increasing sort of interdisciplinary focus in the area? Are you sort of broadly happy with the way that that is developing? Are there things you would like to do to have more of it within the journal? Or? Yeah, I th I, I, I'm happy that we have managed to inc include a number of disciplines, uh, yeah. uh, particularly politics and law. As well. Yeah. Uh, leading, leading people in those areas, also philosophers as well, leading philosophers have written on institutional themes in the journal. So to some extent, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah. One of the problems is the word economics in the title. Mm. Um, and we, we rack our heads about this all, all the time. So we added the the subtitle or masthead, the multidisciplinary form, forum for the study of research or research into economic institutions. Mm. So we try and twist the meaning of economics to its object-based meaning rather than its discipline-based meaning. Hmm. So we don't, we're not promoting an economic approach like some of the standard yeah. text, text would do. Yeah. We're approaching the study of institutions in the economy. But even said, having said that and written it down many times, the misconception is signaled to economists and to non-economists that we're hmm. an economics journal. An economics journal. Um, but I, I, that. Through time, I hope we'll be able to uh, get, get more and more um, understanding of what the mission is. I mean, that's, that, the mission is uh, uh, understood and adopted by the, all the leading people involved in the journal, as my, my co-editors and as a, as a board which um, hmm. runs the journal. Um, and and that, th this strategy is, 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 is prominent there. So hopefully we can pursue this. Um, the journal is expanding very rapidly with submissions, more than 10% 10, 10 a year, so more than the Chinese economy in its highest place of growth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the next question I'd like to ask maybe connects back to um, the earlier discussion we were having about, actually in relation to the, the, the socialism book, is socialism mm. feasible? So um, within this research centre here, we're, we're concerned very much with governance questions. Um, of course, within that area, um, we focused on things like markets and private property, uh, state ownership. But one of the great 
contributions, I think, of institutional economics, certainly people like Ellen Ostrom, who I think work within that broad area, is to point out this whole space that many people have missed, which is sort of between markets and states. Mm. Um, there's even been the argument made that to, to speak in terms of markets and states is a kind of outdated mode of, of analysis, that we actually need to be seeing all solutions to social problems in some sense as being some form of hybrid, that there are very rarely pure types. Um, do you think that is one of the most important contributions of institutional economics to sort of emphasize that all institutions are actually interlinked with other kinds of institutions in some sense, rather than being a pure market type or a pure state type or, or some other type for, for that matter? Yes, I, I'm, I, I, I strongly agree with that. I think the recognition of this interpenetration of different kinds of institutions, their mutual reliance on each other and synergies and interactions that occur is very important. It's, it's a point I've made myself several times. I don't think the terms market or indeed state are obsolete, yeah. but I, I think the, yeah. recon, the recognition of the interpenetration of the two and also, in addition, forms of organisation which don't fit into either, either, either yeah. as Ostrom does yeah. with, with her work on uh, managing the commons, I think uh, is a very important point. I th think this, these less formal, less structured arrangements are crucial in any society. Mm. Uh, they, they, they existed in centrally planned Soviet Union, yeah. and they exist in market economies. Yeah. So we have a quite a complex set of overlapping forms in any complex, large-scale complex economy. Yeah. And I think that insight is, is very important. But it seems to be one that, again, for politically oriented or politically motivated people, um, that seems to be something that people find quite hard to grasp. I'm struck mm. by how few politicians um, are able to articulate that kind of language. I mean, you could say that some people used to talk about, I think the third way was something different, but you could say that people who spoke about a third way were looking for some notion mm -hmm. of, of hybrids. Um, you could even say, I guess, when David Cameron used to speak about the big society, that he was talking about something that was neither markets nor states. But in general, I'm struck by how few political actors are able to use a language which actually covers this terrain Mm. and to put forward policy proposals that might actually reflect it in some sense. Yeah. Is that because it's just an inherently messy area and it doesn't lend itself to communication through the usual sort of political messaging that, that people tend to rely on? Yes, it, 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 it's, it, sound bites become difficult when you, when yeah. you have the, <laughs> the, the qualifications and the hybridity of phenomena involved. But again, I think part of the blame comes down to academics. Um, because I think there's a predisposition to purist solutions in academia on both sides of the debate. Yeah. Uh, and people like to push in one particular direction without nuancing, um, to play to a certain audience. There's also a problem, and I'm not the only one to raise this, this point was raised by Coase and North and several yeah. other people, is that the terms like market are not even well defined mm. in mainstream economics. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I've just written an article on this, Publish an article, mm. social, social economic review, and I talk about mythical markets, the use mm. of market language to yeah. describe things which are not markets. Yeah, and I, I explain why this is. I mean, it may be excusable if it's purely metaphorical. Mm. That many of the cases I give are not obviously not purely mm. metaphorical. They're intended to be stricter comparisons or stricter attributions of market-like characteristics to non-market phenomena. I actually argue this is policy terms quite dangerous. It's mm. misleading, at least. Mm. So um, stripping away the, the metaphorical excuse, I think there's a, a danger in, in, in that kind of thinking. But this this kind this um, in uh, deinstitutionalized view of these phenomena, which is incapable of saying what a market is, what property is, what exchange is, all these core concepts, which hate them or love them, we have to understand what they are, are somehow opaque in, in much theory. Yeah. Um, and this is true, on, again, both sides across, of the debate. Across, 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 yeah. across the debate. It's, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I, I, I did a podcast um, over a year ago now, I think, with Barry Weingast. Um, it was very interesting. I mean, he was speaking in this specific context about development economics and how much of basic theory assumes that 
markets just exist sort of so what he was trying to push back on is the notion that in the beginning there are markets yeah. and then when we f- we figure out whether there are interventions in them yeah. or whether they are failing in some sense and what policies we're going to use yeah. to intervene in them and he says well this is just completely wrong yeah. in the beginning there's violence yes and you actually have to figure out a way out of this violence trap yeah. and that opens up a completely different way of thinking about things it doesn't mean you ignore things like the role of the price system or spontaneous order or those kinds of uh, issues but it means that you approach the very notion of what you're dealing with from a fundamentally different starting point mm. um, and that seems to me something that again people irrespective of their policy position ultimately find quite hard to accept mm. um, but I think Weingast and his co-authors in the book on violence North yeah. and Wallace are right on that point yeah. that we can't take these things for given yeah. and while I disagree with some of the details of the analysis yeah. I think the question they're posing about the origins of order and the, yeah. the marginalisation of violence are crucial to understand how societies mm. work when, when you say in the beginning of Marcus you're of course quoting Oliver Williamson yeah. who was yeah, another yeah, yeah. sort of um, yeah. uh, new institutional economist yeah. as, as they described and this shows a remarkable contrast I think with him North et al mm. on the one hand including Weingast, and, and Williamson and yeah. his followers on the other. Yes, yeah, so I, I think it's a big mistake. and But it is, it's very common, this kind of market being natural thinking, doesn't have to be created. You find it all over the place. Um, I mean, even if you're in favour of markets, and I, I'm in favour of markets, I think you can't assume they're there automatically, the yeah. natural ether of interaction. Uh, you have to sh- show the institutional and social conditions into which they become established and can function. Well, I mean, we've, we've had debates about this ourselves, and, and I'm, I'm very much in favour of markets, but I'm also in favour of pluralism, um, you know, broadly conceived. And I think what, again, really dealing with some of the theme we, themes we've been looking at in, the, in this conversation is to think, is there a way in policy terms um, or in, in some broader sense where people could conceive of allowing different um, institutions to sort of coexist so that we don't see this as being a choice between it's all markets or it's all something else. We actually have different kinds of organization coexisting in a society. You know, that's really what, if you think about that in sort of, um, I mean, I don't hold a religious belief, but if you think about that as a, a solution to the problem of religious conflict, we just tolerate the fact that people have different religions. If we could tolerate the fact that some people prefer mm. different kind of institutional forms, we've got to figure out somehow a way of allowing them to coexist rather than seeking a sort of uh, victory for one side or another. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I struggle with myself with thinking through what does that actually mean in policy terms. But it seems to me that's where the conversation should be going. Um, in, the, in the current climate. I, f- I fully agree. Um, I've been arguing this for a long time. In some ways it's consistent with Hayek about the importance of experimentation yep. and yep. the need for experimentation because of complexity and unpredictability. You don't know how these systems mm. work. You can't design them yep. like blueprints. So you have to try and you have, yep. to, and you have to incrementally yep. try to improve them, adjust them as things, as unforeseen events occur, and so on and so forth. And we have to do this experimentally as an ongoing process. But of course you can't experiment with everything, no. right? You have no. to have something given. No. So I understand the dilemma here, that to what do you take as given and what do, where do you stop hmm. messing around? Where do you say, well, that's good yeah. enough, let's leave it, when you could be wrong, right? You may not be able hmm. to deal with the crisis. But nevertheless, a system that gives more scope for diversity, a pluralist system, and experimentation would be much superior. And I think politics would be much better if we move forward. We're still stuck in Britain yeah. with two big political parties, one of which predilection, let's nationalise it, it's going wrong, let's nationalise it. The other one saying, it's going wrong, let's privatise it and create more competition. Um, I, I think this is just this crude ideological stuff. And they get into power and they implement part of this and the other side when they can undo that and never do we actually have a cool evaluated yeah. experiment what, what's yeah. going on for example um, uh, I, I was in, I've been interested in health economics and yeah. sort of reform health economic systems because these are ex- incredibly complex 
and there's different systems in different countries and have mm. different attributes and performances. Um, uh, when the Blair government s sort of started radically to change you know, the, the health system, why didn't they experiment in one region? Mm. Yeah, uh, they could do that. They could ex just experiment yeah. in re one region. I mean, when the Conservative government introduced yeah. universal credit, why didn't mm. they experiment mm. in, in one region? Why can't we have experiments in mm. in basic income like mm. we have in yeah. Finland and other countries yeah. to see if it works mm. and learn the lessons, adjust it or ditch it, or whatever the case is? Well, I mean, that's that's an interesting one because I think mm. actually a lot of a lot of politicians do nowadays. I think talk about smaller scale experiments but what they I don't think they fully get what experimentation really means so as I see it what, what you tend to have is you might have an experiment but then if it works in one place you automatically roll it out everywhere yes, that's right. so you only have the experiment kind of once yes, that's right. as opposed to an it's ongoing fixed, process right. of yeah. you know challenge contestation yeah. um, it seems to be a one off kind of event yeah. uh, okay. I think that's what happened with universal credit I mean I think they did do yeah. initially a small scale that's trial right. that's but right. then when they thought it worked it they rolled it out everywhere and underfunded uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think um, another problem is the kind of advice they get yeah. From from experts and academics yeah. who to promote their own reputation tend to say this is the this thing is you the must thing. do without being more if you're if you're a consultant you say, Well, on the one hand this could happen, on the other hand I would be very cautious hmm. and mix mix it here. You you don't sound very appealing. Why 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 yeah. are you gonna pay someone thousand, two thousand hmm. pounds or dollars a day? On that it's all saying, well, it's just saying, on the one hand, this, yeah. on the other hand, that. Uh, um, it, it's much more marketable if you come yeah. out in favor of one bold solution, say, this is the, the big fix. Um, so we tend to gravitate, all of us, towards sort of simple solutions. Arguably, this is something which happened with the banking crisis. Mm. Um, the, 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 the quants, the people doing the mathematical modeling, saying, I can show you how to mm. spread your risk. So yeah. you're basically risk-free across the board, yeah. uh, and use my mathematical model, and this will happen, without revealing what the assumptions of the model are concerning mm. uh, sort of the impact of low probability events, for example. Yeah. I mean, well, I, that might be an, uh, a point where we could sort of perhaps move to to wrap up the conversation and just have some reflections on what is happening to economics and the, the study of economics or the way economics is done in the, the contemporary world to think about those kind of questions post, post crisis. I mean, I remember after the, the financial crash, there was a huge amount of actually some activism by students, by various people, sometimes, sometimes in the profession, but more actually people outside saying economics needs to rethink itself in the wake of the, the, the crash. Some of the issues that we've touched upon in the conversation uh, get to parts of that. But my overall sense is that economics hasn't really changed very much at all in, in this period. Maybe 15 years, however long it is, isn't, isn't, isn't long enough. But um, do you see any signs of sort of change within economics that makes you feel that it is equipped to deal with these kind of challenges or, or not? And there are many signs of change within economics. We shouldn't under, underestimate the adaptability and innovativeness yeah. of people working in the mainstream. So we have all these new things coming out all the time, mm. behavioural developments, behavioural economics, yeah. happiness economics. I mean, yeah. every, every two or three years, there's some big thing that comes out. So it's highly innovative, and there's a lot of change. But I argue two things. One is the core, the core, which is basically on the rational, maximising individual, even if he or she has now has some limitations yeah. about the information available or the, the risks involved, yeah. or the cognitive capacities they may have in dealing with it. That's now in the story, or in mm. some parts of the story, it still overestimates the, the, mm. the nature of that beast. It's, it's um, Rational economic man is also consistent with the utilitarian approach, mm. which has a technical mm. flavour or aspect to it, but is not very good in dealing with other things, which Adam Smith went on about, like, mm duty, morality, justice, yeah. all the stuff, yeah. can't really, it sort of degrades them by putting them in yeah. a utilitarian framework. So uh, so there's continuity as well as change. I make this point in the Heterodox Economics book. 
and I get more more pessimistic about the possibility of fundamental change at the core, the, the bit that's mm. continuous. Well, there's lots and lots of change going on. Very impressive innovation. Yeah. The core actually just soldiers ahead. And things like big data, things like um, the empirical turn, will not necessarily change that. There'll still be sort of ceremonial. Hmm. Uh, so you think these are almost like add-ons yes. to something that is That's basically right. a number of people have made that observation about economics. Yeah. People use b- boutique economics. You know, you can hmm. you can shop it. You go into the big store with all the yeah. franchises. And you can buy yeah. this. You can buy that. But it's still the same person organising the whole thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're, we're setting the limits of what's on sale. Uh, um, it's very much like that now. I, I've been very much involved with the uh, the post crass rethinking yep. economic students and met several of them and given talks both in this country and UK and also abroad. And and the, the, they have tremendous energy and and, and 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 I think a lot of things they say are right on the button. But I, I gave a talk, for example, about a year ago in in Germany. Uh, one of these rethink economics meetings, and I asked them to put their hands up. I said, "How many of you uh, are in or going to go into an economics department?" It was a small minority. Hmm. Uh, um, the, many of these people are outside economics. They're complaining hmm. about economics, the influence of economics, hmm. but they're not within economics. Hmm. And the, the, they have rights to do so, and it doesn't mean what they're saying is without value. But it does mean it's difficult to change economics if the critics are on the outside. And that's more and more the case. I mean, I, I guess that relates in some ways to you know, what we are trying to do here in, in this department. I mean, do you think that part of the answer is for people not necessarily to strive to be economists, but to be in other departments that are not economics departments, but mm. to bring in, nevertheless, into those fields, insights that are recognisably from something like an economic point of view or something that's informed by um, some of the debates or concepts that are in economics, you know, both mainstream and heterodox, uh, that that is the way to, to possibly take it forward. Um, yes. Um, I mean, uh, worth experimenting with, so yeah. go back to the experiment yeah. word. Um, but I, th- I think the, uh, the big issues are establishing a presence yeah. in some... Hmm national then global yeah. community because you don't have a disciplinary basis such that's, to, that's right, to yeah. reach out and you, you, the journals and yeah. so on you have to yeah. orientate to ex- yeah. existing journals and existing disciplines yeah. except the journal of institutional economics of yeah. course <laughs> where, you, where you're very welcome to submit your material but uh, the, the, that's exceptional the, the big established yeah. journals are largely yeah. disciplinary orientated um, so it's going to be very difficult but Experiment away. Let's see what happens. Good luck with it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That's been uh, really enjoyed the conversation. So, thanks very much for joining us here at Kings today. And um, to those people listening, I'd very much recommend that you think about buying uh, these two books that Jeff's had out this year: "Is Socialism Feasible?" and "Is There a Future for Heterodox Economics?" So, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>